This is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery and the Radical Recovery Summit. And I'm really happy to be here today with Dr. Diane Poole Heller. And it would take a while to, to list all of your, your credentials and your achievements, but I wanted to highlight a couple of them. One of them being your long-term connection with Dr. Peter Levine and somatic experiencing, being a senior trainer with his work. And you have several books about attachments. So we're going to get into attachment here today as well. And you just had that hugely successful trauma and attachment summit, which I watched. And I know many people that I know watched as well. So let's talk about how you got to where you are now, that big question. But in, in specifically, how did you get into this kind of work? And you've been doing this for a long time. What are you seeing? How have you... Uh, you know, how are you seeing the whole field of trauma therapy in particular as it's evolved over the last several years and in particular with Peter's work and your work? Well, thank you. And Lynn, it's so nice to be here. And I really appreciate the group taking time out to listen and check in. So hi to everybody. Uh, gosh, I've been in the trenches a long time. I think mm -hmm. I started teaching, I started studying with Peter in 1989. And I started teaching around 1995. And uh, we still teach together online. We mm -hmm. do uh, collaborate online. And uh, I love working with him. He's definitely been a wonderful mentor in my life. Um, and I came to him, like many people do, from my own personal trauma history, reared its ugly head. And <laughs> he, he was about the only person back then in 1989 that mm -hmm. I have, could find. And I did a big search that really understood, especially the physiological underlining components of it. And um, Peter likes to work with severe stuff, so he had a, he had a good uh, collaboration with me, and we, I, I used to tell him, you know, anytime you have a cancellation, I'll come, you know, so I would drive up, like, on spur of the moment, and I did a lot of sessions with him the first two years, and uh, he helped me quite a bit, so that was my pathway in. I never thought I would be, end up being in the trauma field. I started out in business and, you know, women's health and all sorts of other things, but um it was as as often happens when you go through your own healing process it, it can become a little bit of a mission you know yeah uh, true and so when you so what what's your phd in my phd is in higher education and social change so it has a lot to do with how do we help society how do we help underrepresented groups how do we help people through education to um live a better and more equal and more friendly and more sense of well-being kind of life uh, through education. So at, that's, as you know, the, all I do is get to talk online and, and put out material and teaching, hopefully with life-affirming material from my own work, but also from many, many other people's work. I try to promote anything that I find effective and life-affirming, and that includes many, many people's ways of entering into a healing process or doing therapy. Mm -hmm. So if you had to, this might not be quite a fair question, but if you had to summarize for people the most important things to know about trauma, how would you start them off? What would you start them with? Well, I can say what happened for me in my personal experience, and now my personal experience has expanded to talking to many, many experts in the field. So I have a, a little bit of an encyclopedia of what's going on in the trauma and attachment world right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been a huge step forward to add the somatic strategies to all of the cognitive and emotional work that we've known how to do for a long time and really mm -hmm. understand how to regulate the nervous system and how to take people into dark places and meet them there, but also do it slowly enough and um, with enough regulation processes happening, whether it's through corrective experiences or evoking physical procedural memory, like pushing away or inviting in, um, all sorts of different things the body signals us to do. I think that additional wisdom has made healing much, much uh, more efficient, you know? And the other thing that I find really helpful, I just worked with somebody right before I got on the call that had had several sessions with many practitioners and just wasn't getting anywhere fast enough. I mean, a little bit would happen, but not, not enough to really have a deeper healing. And uh, I worked so deeply with his encaps what I call encapsulated child, you know, that we might call inner child, but in mm -hmm. a way that helps heal the intrapsychic relationship between his adult self and this wounded, very, very wounded self. And then also to bring in resources from the outside. I, I know in internal family systems, they only do the intrapsychic, but I also like to add like 
who his, were good comfort and protectors for him. And as soon as we brought in more resources for this really wounded inner child, he this inner child state really started to respond and we were able to move him forward through time and to get out of the really terrible situation he was in, as well as evoke really painful feelings and process them in a way where clients can integrate as they go. That's why I think understanding physiology, the polyvagal work, the nervous system regulation, but also not shying away from bringing up threat again, but making sure that you do it in such a way that you're pendulating between stress and resource so that a person can integrate the difficult material as they go. Right. And so I know from um, Peter's book about traumatic memory, about how that encapsulated child doesn't know that they're not still that age. No, trauma stops time. And I was explaining this to my client this morning. It's like you're you're operating, you're on, on the today time zone, but you're also highly influenced by the history, the trauma history time zone. And that could be several time zones. You could have something happen at five, something happen at 10, something happen at, you know, three and a half. Um, but as you release the trauma from each of those earlier ages, then all that life force and vitality and joy and creativity and rest and relaxation can um, become more of a foundational state for the for the adult self. So it's really magical how humans are designed to heal. You know, I, I'm so impressed by how we are able to do this because I don't know of any other species and I that can do it's actually has a word for it. It's called autonoesis. Autonoesis. And what autonoesis means is that we can time travel in our consciousness. So you can get stuck at five, but you can also heal at five and then release that energy and move forward in time, you know. So um it's it's a wonderful part of our design in terms of how our consciousness can be accessed and how we can promote healing. Mm-hmm. So one question I often ask people is, do you believe that everyone can heal? So I guess You know, I, I'm a very optimistic person and also not just based on belief because I've sat in the room with people in very, very dark experiences and I feel that people can heal. I, I, I feel like the degree that we can do it, I think most people can access resiliency that's quite marvelous, even if they've been Holocaust survivors or, or mm-hmm. had really, really difficult backgrounds. And there are some people that it's just hard to um, access them in, it, it, or it might be my limitation as a therapist too, you know, that I don't have quite the right technique or quite the right insight into what will be most helpful for them where it sometimes it takes a long time and you kind of go inch by inch. But for mm-hmm. some clients, inch by inch is really significant. So I just want to yeah. say that to any therapists that are listening is you, patience is really important. And sometimes you're working with somebody that really isn't in your field of expertise and it's time to refer them to somebody that could be more helpful. And I'm, I'm always very, you know, aware of that. If I, if I know of anybody that I think can be more helpful, I definitely will get them connected to that person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So one of the, there's a couple things I want to follow up on, but let's start with the um, somatic experiencing. And then I want to move more into how you're working with that encapsulated child. Okay. So what is it that people do in somatic experiencing sessions? So what could someone expect? I know there's a broad range of how people work, but you've been, you've trained people, you've been in this field for so long. What, what are some of what people might expect if they're signing up with a somatic experiencing practitioner? Yeah, I think I've been teaching it for like 30 years or something. Peter calls me the dinosaur because I've been around so long. <laughs> um, you know, there's certain highlights for me, and I'm probably not in this amount of time going to be able to do it justice. So know that this is like the appetizer level. But um, what I think is really helpful is pacing and dosing. I'm not sure Peter calls it that, but mm-hmm. that's what I call it. It's just knowing how eventually you learn how to be with all these different clients and everybody has a different nervous system, but as long as they have a brain and a nervous system, you can do this work, fortunately. Um, but you need to be able to read, like I call it red light, green light, when the nervous system is with you and integrating and that's a green light to go forward. And also that you don't shy away from the threat, but you also make sure you're regulating as you go. So it's important to bring threat up so that activation or that challenge is available to the person, but maybe only in really small doses, depending on the person. The stronger their resiliency, the more 
chunks of high activation you can do at one time. So sometimes what I can do in the first session with somebody is very different than what I can do in the 10th session because I can cover a lot more ground because their nervous systems learned how to regulate and it begins to trust me and their and them that we're not going to overload it. Or if we overload it, we're going to resource them right away to get them back into the window of tolerance, as Dan Siegel would say. I tend to call it the range of resiliency. But um, you have to be brave enough to work outside the range of resiliency just a little bit either way, either too much sympathetic nervous system, too much high arousal or too much shutdown, uh, dorsal vagal or parasympathetic, and then bring that back into the middle and then go out and grab some more high activation or, or shutdown experience, which is also high activation, and bring it to middle. And that takes, I think that's like the art of it. I, I know I can usually do probably five times in a session now than what I could do, you know, when I started. And like, so it, and it also depends on the person's nervous system. Now, if somebody has a really resilient, super strong, regulated nervous system, and you want to take them into cathartic work, they can actually handle that. And they might go into a breakthrough, which causes a lot of confusion in the field. People will say, I have people, you know, pounding pillows and yelling or whatever. And they go to these epiphanies. That means usually they have a regulated nervous system, but somebody that has a challenged nervous system, if you put that, push that intensity through an already really overstressed nervous system, it's likely you're going to get into emotional volatility or uh, dissociation. So it's, it's sort of knowing, really knowing the physiology of the person sitting in front of you. And I think that's a huge contribution that Peter Levine and all of the people that work with him have made to the field. And now it's becoming more normal because we have somatic um, sensory motor processing. We have more physiological att attunement, I believe, in EMDR now. And it's, it used to be, I mean, when I started out, the idea that body and mind were connected was like a revolutionary idea, which sounds so ridiculous now. But, you know, yeah. I started people like, really? You know, and so okay. this whole idea of allowing body wisdom in is, is, is a huge contribution from Peter. And also that he studied ethnology so much with animals and how they recover from mm. stress that, mm -hmm. um, the thing that he does that's different than polyvagal theory is he also evokes and helps us learn how to evoke and complete defensive orienting responses. So this procedural memory of whatever you needed to do at that time of threat, but we were, you know, were thwarted because it was too overwhelming. And so you activate that and complete it. And it really opens the door then to, to in the normal physiological sequence to regain access to social engagement uh, that Peter, uh, uh, Stephen Porges and Deb Dana would talk about. And what I love about Deb Dana's work is she accesses, uh, you know, the ventral, which are sort of the higher resource, the higher functioning parts of the brain. And then that takes that with her into the trauma so that the person always has access to the higher functioning parts of the brain because trauma usually bypasses that and goes immediately, you know, skips the hippocampus and all these other ways that could be helpful and moves straight into um implicit memory. So that's why it's tricky to work with and why I think really having some good training with people that really understand trauma can be so beneficial. Mm -hmm. I know I'm surprised at how many people, when I say something like, are you breathing? They're like, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> right, right. And I think right. it's really helpful for people to understand the nervous system because what's happening is not their fault. It's these are involved. The physiological, normal, that's yeah. very encouraging for people to hear too, that they're not mm -hmm. like, sometimes they get, feel like they're damaged goods, which is so not true. Mm -hmm. uh, they just are in a physiological state or in a trauma reaction that's normal. And that, that isn't helping them have a, a life that they really enjoy. So when we understand how to work the physiological part, as well as emotional, as well as meaning making, as well as cognitive work, uh, dream work, there's so many different avenues, but the body wisdom, so much can get processed through the body wisdom. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Well, one of the things that people often feel a little goofy about is working with the inner child. Mm. It's like, really, you want me to make friends with my five year old? Like, how do I do that? So can you talk about that a little bit? And maybe we could start to bring in some of the attachment as well. Sure. You know, Jean Houston was the first person that's put that idea out into the marketplace through writing books about the inner child. And she said, she, it's the thing she regrets the most. And the reason she says that is because people misinterpreted what she wanted to do as we access the inner child by just kind of having it become 
in charge of everything, which is not the right part of us to be in charge, right? It's the part that <laughs> needs to be healed. So yeah. people kind of took it to, a, you know, like people would say, oh, you're wearing purple and that reminds me of my perpetrator and now my inner child's upset. And, you know, so people are always trying to rearrange the world to fit the inner child, which is, I mean, that's a, a certain level of attunement, but what really needs to happen with what I tend to call encapsulated child or inner child, same thing. Some people call it ego state work, doesn't matter what label you put on it. But the way I work with it is, first of all, to have a person see if they can access, if they can go back from the adult self to see the younger self. And in and, and one trauma at a time. So there might be something that happened at five, and you don't want to get them all on board at the same time. You want to be working one, one event. And sometimes, like this morning, I worked with someone, it was from a whole span of years. So sometimes I'll be saying, well, from three to 10 when this happened, or from you know five to 17, or whatever it is. But um, you're, you're just seeing if they can connect to that inner state, that traumatized state usually, and see what that age is holding, because they, again, get stopped in time, and then see if you can uh, build, start building a relationship between the, ma the mature adult self and the child self, so there's a compassionate, hopefully supportive relationship eventually, and mm -hmm. then also really be seeing what that child needed or what emotions needed to be felt that nobody was there for, and the inner child was usually alone or wasn't well supported when the trauma happened because that's why it gets stuck, right? right. If you yeah. have a lot of support, sometimes you have a terrible trauma, but you have such great support, it doesn't end up being stuck in time. It ends up getting processed. But mm -hmm. so often what happens, especially with sexual abuse or things that have kind of a taboo around them uh, to talk about, get really stuck. And so um, you were trying to start a dialogue, but sometimes I ask questions like, well, what does, what is that little boy or that little girl feeling? What is that eight-year-old wanting to let you know? Uh, that must've been horrible. What you told me what happened is really, really scary and, and was so unfair. What, what are some of the things that they might want? Now, sometimes I pretty much can tell what somebody would need. Like they were glaringly lacking support. So I'll immediately say, well, I just wonder if any time in your life, and that can be today or even a movie you saw or a book you read, did you, have you had experience with someone that was really a competent protector, somebody that knew how to have someone's back and would really mm -hmm. step up? They wouldn't just have good attentions, but they would take action, the appropriate action. And I import that person. Um, now, sometimes it's the person's adult self, like they would be that person. Sometimes it's me as the therapist. And so often it's like a mentor they had in college or somebody they respect. And they bring that person in. And I said, now, what would you see this competent protector do or say for you at that age? And then they get to see somebody actually doing the right thing, but they're creating how that happens. I might menu yeah. a few things like, would they get you out of there? Would they duke it out with the perpetrator? Would they say stop and you're not ever going to touch this kid again? What would they do? So sometimes I menu it and then the person goes, oh, they wouldn't do that. They would do this, which is great. I'm trying to get to what they need the person to do. And then we kind of play that out. And like, what's it feel? What happens in your body? And very often there's an emotional reaction. Um, and there's just more communication. It's so brave of these inner children to show up. And I try to help the adult self that sometimes is embarrassed by what happened or doesn't want to mm -hmm. acknowledge it. Um, I said, look how courageous this part of you is that's been struggling and trapped in this experience. And they're talking to you and they're showing you what feelings they need to have support to feel and they're feeling them and you're allowing it. And I'm just trying to kind of ne navigate uh, and, and negotiate a good relationship, ultimately intrapsychically, because like IFS says, internal family systems, you know, the inner child has the adult self 24-7 to have the therapist maybe one hour a week or one hour every two weeks. So you want to make sure you're building that intrapsychic resource as well as I, I believe that the external resources can be helpful too. So I, I do everything. I bring it all in. Right. Okay. Okay. And when you started talking about that, what, what came to mind was that movie, The Bodyguard with Kevin Costner. Yeah. And it's like, if we actually can support ourselves and have real people that support us, we're not so vulnerable to that story of I need someone to swoop in and protect me and take me away. There's so much romantic drama. It's so popular for a reason. Mm -hmm. you know, so many of us didn't feel protected and seen. And, and well, what we happens if, if, if we look to the wisdom of memory reconsolidation is when you, when you access with a threatening, wounding experience, that memory comes up. It's been encoded all over the brain. It kind of comes up and you're inserting all these comp, these, um, positive experiences. And I always 
say to clients, I know this didn't happen in reality when you were a kid. You didn't have the support, but just see what difference it makes. But when you bring that memory back in, it will be uh, contaminated in a good way with the corrective experiences, the experience of a competent protector, the experience of being able to have a voice and say what happened, the experience of being able to feel your feelings and being supported because the therapist is there. They're not alone this time. That makes a huge difference. And, And then the brain over time and sometimes immediately will always choose the more adaptive response. We're wired for that. So Mm -hmm. you're using, again, the physiology we know and understand to support the healing process. And it makes it so much more efficient. Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, the the brain does want to feel connected and then that disconnect that happened. So if we can attach securely to our adult self, that's ideal. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's talk about attachment. So what are some of the... Maybe you could go through kind of the four that you mentioned and okay. what are they and, and, and kind of how you might work with those now as an adult or how, how you might even recognize it in yourself. Okay. Uh, first of all, we have an attachment quiz on our website. We are updating it and improving it. It has a little, few little um, you know, typos and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's at dianepoolheller.com and you can get, it's just a point of exploration, but it gives you a little pie chart of what attachment styles you might be mostly working with and that we often can have a mix of attachment reactions and attachment you need to take that quiz one relationship at a time because uh you may have a different relational reaction to one person's style of relating with you than somebody else so if you're thinking about your mom just take the whole questionnaire thinking about mom and then Mm -hmm. maybe dad and then maybe your your husband or some important partners in your life or friends or colleagues or bosses or whatever but just take you can take it as much as you want it's free but just keep doing it uh one relationship at a time. And also to, when you're taking that test, think about times when you're not at your best, you know, maybe when you're a little tired or sick, or how do you react when there's stress in a relationship? That'll give you more uh, useful information about your attachment style. Uh, so that's a handy resource that you can access. But basically, I, I believe I'm in the John Bowlby camp where secure attachment is biological. We are designed to uh, look for safe haven with our caregivers. Um, It's a really important understanding that way. And um, we're designed to have a secure attachment system and a lot of things can get dumped on top of it and it can get interrupted by trauma. And I wanna talk about what happens when we adapt away from secure attachment because we're adapting to the deficits of our caregiver or the environment or culture or what, you know, World War II is happening or, you know, people are being marginalized or whatever's happening that might be challenging to the attachment system. But um, it's not just parenting. It can be other things. But I'm going to focus on parenting just because of the time we have. Um, the, uh, the secure attachment we need to understand the best because that's your primary attachment system. Your secondary one is when you adapt away from it. So my belief and my clinical experience uh, is strongly tilted towards we can adapt back to secure attachment when we get the right support. And so doing corrective experiences and having a person experience what difference it makes when something healthy is happening actually is supporting us to go back to and learn secure attachment even if we adapted away from it very good reasons, whatever they were, when we were little or later on in life. So I have a very, uh, I feel it's a very hopeful uh, piece of information. And I'm really grateful to all the people that worked on attachment uh, theory as it evolved and Mary Main and Mary Ainsworth and so many people have contributed to this field. Uh, Dan Siegel, Alan Shore. I mean, there's a countless list of people. And what I'm trying to do in the DARE work, which stands for Dynamic Attachment Repatterning Experience, because our whole goal is to move people towards secure attachment and then clinically how to do that, which is something you mentioned you want to go into. Um, We really specialize in how do we clinicalize, so to speak, uh, attachment theory. And let's Mm -hmm. so. Certainly, let's start with what is secure attachment, because a lot of times people think it's having a roof over your head, it's three meals a day, it's um, getting trips to the doctor, which of course are very important, Uh, but it's a lot more than that, actually. It has uh, what really helps people stay in secure attachment initially or find it again is one of the most important things is how you use your voice. Stephen Porges talks about prosody and tone of voice, and when we're stressed as women, we tend to get very shrill and high, you know? And when we're stressed as men, we tend to lower our voice and kind of boom, get really loud. 
-hmm. Now that's evolutionarily helpful because if let's say we're back in caveman days and a tiger walks in the, I don't know, brontosaurus, whatever, (laughs) walks into the camp and and you hear this shrill sound or this booming sound, that's Mm -hmm. immediately going to turn everybody's amygdala on. The threat response is going to go through the entire camp or tribe or whatever, and everybody's going to know danger, danger, danger. So people react very quickly to those those sounds. But the problem is if you're trying to work out something with your partner or your kids and you're, you get shrill or you get booming, um, that's going to turn them into their threat response. And they're only going to be wanting to fight you or get away from you or numb out. They're not going to be in the part of the brain that wants to work out relational things or work, work something out. So how we use our voice is really important. So therapists need to listen to their voice and make sure they have somewhat of a melodic prosody when they're talking to their clients because it signals safety in a really deep primitive part of the brain. Um, So we can use all this knowledge in a way to repair attachment ruptures that might be happening in different relationships too by shifting how we interact with certain things. So there's certain secure attachment skills that I have my clients practice and I teach in my trainings. But let's just do a quick review of what secure attachment is. First of all, your capacity to be present with someone is super important. That's a big part of secure attachment. You show up, you're yourself, you're authentic, you're there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Safety, orienting to safety. Um, Now, safety doesn't mean that you don't ever take risks. When people have a safe haven in their marriage or as a parent, the kids have that with their parents, um, or the parents have that in a community or they have that in their marriage or their partnership, then you have the resources to go out into the community and give your gift, take risks, do all sorts mm-hmm. of things because you can come back and have this source of safety. So it's not like safety, like you never go anywhere. Like, right. you know, the ship only stays in the harbor because it's safe. That doesn't make any sense. It's designed to go out and explore the world. So um, it's, it's not, it actually facilitates risk taking. Cause some people say to me, you're always talking about safety. Then people don't do anything. You know, they don't won't take any, I'm like, no, no, actually safety promotes risk taking in a, in a, an intelligent way. Um, eye gaze, mm-hmm. you know, that you have this gleam in your eye of you're special to me, or I'm open to you, or if it's a love, a partner, I love you. Or if your kids, I love you to try this with your dog. I love you. You send little beam gleams to people that are important to your life or strangers. I mean, it's amazing if you go into the grocery store and you just send people these mm-hmm. beam gleams, how, how, what changes and, and try it with your dog. Your dog will love it. You know, so this is a very powerful thing that doesn't cost anything. You can be at a party. Well, not these days right now, but you can be at a gathering eventually, <laughs> eventually, and um, shoot a beam gleam to someone, that, a friend across the room or your partner or whatever. And it strengthens the attachment bond bond just by you're with your group of friends they're with their group of friends you're in two different conversations but you can just look at them and send and they look at look at you for a moment and you send this oh you're the best you know energy through the eyes and your face to them and it really helps the attachment bond so these are secure attachment things if people remember to do them make a gigantic difference and they're so simple Um, playfulness, having time to play, laugh. We're kind of missing some of that (laughs) these days, but the more we can figure out how to do it on Zoom or, you know, have do it with our pets or whatever, the people we are able to live with in a safe way, playfulness is super important to um, the attachment bond. So increasing your playtime, and, and, you know, in, in the United States and many cultures, we're so work productive oriented. It's so good to make sure that you're making sure there's playtime. containing whatever emotional states arise, like when parents are able to be with shame or be with pain or be with sadness or be with grief or be with joy and exuberance because some parents don't know how to deal with that. Whatever emotional states you can have safe containment with, and as therapists, we want to make sure we make that space available to our clients, um, then these emotional states don't get disowned. David Wallen, uh, who wrote Attachment and Psychotherapy, he talks about whatever feelings weren't allowed in your family. Some families, it's anger. Some families, it's joy. Some families, it's grief. Some families, it's shame. Then that gets disowned and and dissociated from. So we're trying to bring all this emotional range back into an acceptable zone and where people have their full emotional range. And that's part of what happens when you allow whatever arises in secure attachment. That's part of secure attachment. How we come and go, how we have, uh, 
like Stan Tacken talks about the welcome home hug, you know, taking time when you're, one of you has been out to work and coming back into the home and the other one's already there that you kind of stop what you're doing if you can and you meet that person, you make it like a formal time to meet and you do a, a, a body to body hug, not a pyramid hug like sometimes we do in America. <laughs> Just make sure you do a full body hug where you stay in the hug long enough that you can feel your body regulate the other person and you and your body's being regulated and your body wants to be with people and situations that are regulating so if you take time to do just a simple welcome home hug or a, or a hug before you leave you know comings and goings this really enhances the attachment bond and can resolve a lot of it, uh, relational problems i can give you examples of it later um what else you, a person needs to learn how to co-regulate. People that have avoidant attachment don't, that we'll talk about in a minute don't often have that. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to help them learn that in in their relationships or if they're in therapy. And um, the we also that that is the foundation for how we learn to self-regulate. So we both, you know, we both need we need our whole capacities to develop around um, how we regulate ourselves, and that's another big contribution of somatic experiencing was mm -hmm. a lot of uh, really useful skills on how to how to regulate mostly they focus on self-regulation i focus a lot on interactive regulation as well um and then a big thing if you don't take anything away from this today at all uh the, mo the if you only take one thing it would be about repair like how do we become sensitive to misattunements in our relationships and then how do we initiate repair and also receive repair from other people um, that brings us back into building relationship resiliency as we um, are marching down the road, especially in long-term relationships, really an important part of what makes them healthy and sustainable. And John Gottman says, if you learn to initiate and receive repair, you have 85% more chance in your intimate relationship of staying in a state of well-being. I mean, 80, if you got an 85% return wow. on your money, you wouldn't even buy, be buying Starbucks or a cup of coffee. You'd be putting all your money in the bank because you'd be making so much benefit from it. So that's sure. why I really emphasize repair. There's huge, huge payoff for learning how to repair. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is having uh, that secure attachment is having an easy flow between uh, being alone. I need my alone time but also mm -hmm. being able to be in connection without either one of those states being stressful. In the attachment adaptations, one or both of those states are stressful. So that's, that's how you know when people have moved mostly into secure attachment, and you can do it one skill at a time, um, they start to become much more relaxed in a relational field and right. also in their own field of themselves, you know, their own autonomous experience. Also, they're relaxed in that capacity as well. So those are, that's the highlights of secure attachment. And I'll give you a chance to ask me a question or make a comment. Yeah, what's, what's really, um, what I'd really like to explore more is the repair process. Hmm. Um, and that it's possible, you know, some, so many times when people have a fight reaction, and they say things, they lash out, they say things that are really hurtful, they end up so isolated and so alone and so ashamed. Hmm. And if that happens over and over, the other person learns that it's not safe to be around them. Mm. So if somebody's in that kind of a situation, how do you even start to work with that? Well, if I was the person who was making the angry comments, first of all, I might want to take some responsibility to do the healing work I might need to do because probably there's some unresolved trauma fueling that so that if they can you know have some compassion towards themselves about that and then do the work they need to do it can be helpful or even that could be in the relationship or that could be in therapy however they want to do that rituals whatever works um but uh initiating repair might just be like i know i lashed out i and and i'm really sorry i know i hurt your feelings and i'm i really I did this and I would be specific about what I did so the person knows that you get what you did you know when I okay. said this when I when I you know whatever <laughs> swung a pillow at you or whatever it was that happened um it's good to be concrete about what you feel was off and then and then not follow it with but but I was sick but I was tired but I'd worked 70 hours but the dog wouldn't stop barking but you know you just get rid of that part of the sentence because that sort of negates the first part. <laughs> yeah. So get rid of the, get the, like, Ariat Lerner wrote a book, Why Won't You Apologize, which I recommend everybody. I just heard a podcast with her about this. And um, she says uh, that that's one of her major tips is don't say but. And then the other thing is sometimes 
it takes a lot of self-esteem and strength to apologize, to make a repair. So mm-hmm. when you're in your more regulated sense of self, that's easier to do. If you're in the middle of still having a lot of unresolved trauma, you can be pretty fragmented and not have a stable sense of self. And many times people that are in that state really can't apologize or it's unlikely they'll apologize. So if you are apolo- if you're trying to work something out with somebody who has a, a more fragility that because they just haven't healed quite as much as they need to yet, you may need to understand that you're apologizing for your part of it, even if you feel like what the other person did was worse. Uh, mm-hmm. And you just stay on your apology for your part of it. And you, this is the hard part. This is really like masterclass level, advanced level. You need to enter into that conversation, realizing that the other person may not have the capacity to meet you. They may not have the capacity to own their part. They may not have the capacity to acknowledge or recognize or without going into a shame spiral about what they did. But it's important for our own maturation and growth. To, for, regardless of what the other person does or doesn't do to do the repair, because we actually grow and mature and we take that maturity into all of our other relationships. So there's a win in it, whether the other person responds or doesn't, or cuts you off or doesn't allow it to happen. Your one-sided reconciliation is still really important to do. And ideally, I mean, often, if you sincerely make an apology, um, the other person, if they have enough strength of self-esteem, will respond and say, well, I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, I realize I did this also and, you know, that sort of thing. But you want to honor the hurt feelings and not go so much into explanation. Like I did it because blah, 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 blah. It's more like I see that I really, you know, I really made you feel bad and, and, uh, or what I said was really hurtful because Mm -hmm. you really don't want to take responsibility for other people's feelings. Exactly. But um, it's, it's very helpful to practice and go in with certain intention and then also realize that it may be end up being a one-sided reconciliation but it, you're making peace with yourself inside yourself i mean when i've made it repair attempts i feel good that i tried you know i did my best and maybe i didn't do it perfectly but i put that energy out there and even if somebody comes back with even more attack or whatever i just go okay i i did what i could do and i i can kind of move on then i can i have a sort of peace in myself so usually you're going to have a little bit better response where people go oh i'm so appreciate you acknowledging that thank you you know that's Mm -hmm. that's really helpful some people use apology or repair attempts this is a really important not to do like say your kid didn't do his homework and they got a bad grade on a text or whatever and they go oh hey mom and dad I I'm sorry I didn't study I was on my computer and I was doing video games or whatever and uh and then you you just need to say thank you for acknowledging that and I really appreciate took a lot of guts and a lot of bravery for you to say that to me and then not use it as a teaching moment now you know next time you (laughs) should you should do your homework you you want to because that will teach kids not to apologize because then they see it like I apologize I try to repair and then I get lambasted with you know, mm-hmm. what I did wrong again. So, and that's hard as parents not to use that as a teaching moment, just to say, thank you, honey. I know that took a lot of courage and I really appreciate you acknowledging that. Done, right. done. done. <laughs> Stop talking, done, <laughs> you know? And then later, later, you know, you let some time pass. You can say, okay, honey, do you need help with your homework or how's it going with that project? Later, another time. (laughs) But if you want your kids to apologize, you need it to be a good experience. And that's the same for us in our adult relationships too, right? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like it's a good idea to not talk too much, period. No matter which side of that you're on. Sometimes less is more. But you do want to acknowledge what you feel went awry. Right. And then, and then the other thing that Harriet Lerner really emphasized that I liked a lot was that you need to communicate, you know what, I, I'm apologizing for this and I realize it might take some time for you to process all the feelings you have about it, might bring mm-hmm. up feelings, and I'm available to talk to you again. So that it's not just like one and done. It's like right. I'm here to discuss this further. That availability is really appreciated. Right. And so when you were, when you were saying, um, you know, this is what I've done. I'm taking responsibility. I'm sorry. I hurt your feelings because of this. Mm -hmm. And then if you go into, but I was this, I was that, you know, it's because of my own trauma or something. 
then you're kind of manipulating the other person into feeling sorry it, for you. It, it sort of negates the uh, effectiveness of the apology. So I would, I would just suggest to people try this or get Harriet's book and go through the steps. I think uh, it's called What, Why You Don't Apologize. I think mm -hmm. this is the title of it. I just got it in the mail. I just bought it recently. Um, or even how you feel when somebody's apologizing to you, but then they go into this lengthy explanation of why you should make it should be okay that they, you know, erupted on you or something. So it it just it it just it kind of gets to be more about them than more about you, and that sort of takes the folk. It sort of dilutes the repair attempt because I think it's a big skill. And and you know, I ask people in my trainings how many of them had parents that modeled. Uh, good repair in their own marriages or their own relationships and then also in their relationships personally with them mm -hmm. and usually it's about five percent so this is not something we can uh, assume we know how to do because most of us weren't modeled for it we usually feel a little awkward and it mm -hmm. kudos to going into the into that lack of comfort uh to challenge it but the payoff is so huge i if anybody wants to do anything over the next few months just try a repair or let somebody repair with you sometimes people don't repair mm -hmm. their attempt to repair is is not so great i mean even your dog if he gets into the trash well you come home and they're like wagging their tail and dragging their head like, well i'm sorry <laughs> you know let the repair happen you know right. and sometimes maybe you wanted it, them to say it differently or they didn't see part of it but let yourself receive repairs more generously and go and see the intent even if it's not executed perfectly because a lot of times it's not mm -hmm. but try to be a little more generous like i've had people say well you didn't use the right word or you didn't apologize within 24 hours so it doesn't count or you know I mean people do okay. these things where they they negate the repair attempt which then really trashes the relationship so mm -hmm. we are going to need to repair because we're all imperfect people and that's fine that's normal we're going to yeah. make mistakes we're going to be tired and be abrupt and be brash sometimes it's okay I mean it's we, we try not to do those things but we will especially under these stressors we've had lately mm -hmm. um, that might be happening more with all the stress of the pandemic and just mm -hmm. all the things that are going on in the world is a little challenging right now. Mm -hmm. So I've talked to a lot of people that are like relationship experts and they go, oh yeah, I can tell. I get, I watch the news and I get off the news and I'm irritable and I'm irritable with my wife or my husband. And I'm like, yeah, so just, just like saying, oh, you know what, honey, I'm really sorry that I, I, it was partly the news, but I really want you to know, I love you and I want us to work this out. And you're mm -hmm. really the most important person in my life and whatever is true and you need to acknowledge. Right. So if we were to bring that and circle back around to working with the encapsulated child. So there's so often a kind of a, a mistrust on the part of the child. It's like, well, you never took care of me so far. Like, why should I believe you now? So right. how would right. you work with that? Well, I just did this really beautiful example of this right before I got on the call with the client. Um, what was sorely missing in his experience was anybody protective like he was being beat up at school and they kept blaming him for starting fights and he wasn't he was being bullied he was mm -hmm. the victim but he kept getting blamed as okay well it takes two to tango you know but it didn't i mean he was it wasn't it wasn't taking two he was getting really hurt and then on top of it being blamed for and it wasn't the accurate situation so first thing I did was bring in somebody that would get him, that would get the truth and would, would have his back. And he found someone in his history that is really good at that as a leader and was a, you know, really highly skilled military person and just knew what to do. And so this person came in and was like confronting the principal and then eventually confronting the other kid that they were addressing these kids as if they were equal partners in this fight, which was not the situation. And this mm -hmm. went on for a long time. This kid was bullied for years. So um, we changed that dynamic. We had this competent protector address the principal and, you know, confront them on their cluelessness and then also confront the um, the, the kid that was the bully in a way that you do this again, you know, you'll meet an answer to, you know, that kind of thing, just really mm -hmm. to stop it, which is what needed to happen in an ideal world. And I kept saying this in an ideal world, this would have happened and this wouldn't even be a problem today, but it yeah. didn't, you were alone and isolated right now. You're with me. You're not alone going it because strong feelings came up. And I said, and you've got this other person who's got your back. And then, and then, at, and then I kept checking in. That's the thing you need to keep checking in. And this may be over several sessions, right? Um, but in this one session, I said, so I'm just going to go back. And is there anything else that younger child needs right now that we haven't 
addressed that comes up right now because mm -hmm. you want to keep checking. And um, and he was telling me how clear he was about the office where this happened and that the child saw everything in detail because when you have a trauma memory, it gets etched in your brain in a really deep way because of the intensity and the duration of it. And um, so I got the experience because he had said in the intake that he had this the trouble when he was in conflict in his relationships that he felt trapped. And I got that right away. I'm like, your child's still trapped in that office. And he acknowledged that. And I said, let's have that competent protector get you the heck out of there. And so then I said, how do you want to do that? You make your own movie. How do you want to get out of it? How, how can this person help you get out of the office? And so he had this whole thing just came up spontaneously. Oh, he's grabbing my hand. He's taking me out of the office. Um, we're going outside. My bike's there. I get on my bike. I'm riding my bike and I'm riding into nature and it feels really beautiful. And he goes on and on and on and about the, the resources that start to unfold. And then he's not trapped, right? Mm -hmm. And that memory no longer has that trap quality intact anymore. Because like I said, that memory comes up, you fill it with resources and you address the really difficult feelings. And then when that memory goes back, there's a lot more resiliency there and the brain will choose the more adaptive response. So, but I didn't, I would not have known that he was still trapped in the office if I hadn't asked that third cycle of going right. back in and connecting with the encapsulated child. So that encapsulated child will, t once you have enough trust for it to talk and show up, it will tell you everything you need to know. It will, it's basically guiding the healing because it's saying, if you ask the right questions, it will just tell you. And I, he didn't, the little child self didn't report feeling trapped, but I just knew that from the intake. And that made total sense to me that he was still trapped in that horrible situation. So yeah. then of course it makes sense to get him out of there. Right. So it's like, they're leading you, but you kind of need to understand what trauma does. So you ask an intelligent question and suggest an intelligent um, resolution. And I always tell my clients, I'm just suggesting some things. They might not be the wrong, they might be the wrong things. What your child wants to do is most important. So don't follow my instruction. Just go, no, it's not that, it's this. And then we know we're on the right track. And that's a green light for going forward. Right. So is that what you're talking about when you're when you're talking about moving to more adaptive? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I call them corrective experiences. It's sort of like you're inserting what should have happened, what would have been the healthy thing to happen. Right. Like this kid was left alone and blamed for something. It'd be like blaming a Holocaust survivor for World War II. I, just, I mean, it was so off, yeah. you know, I mean, people were well-intentioned. Yeah, great. But it was totally off. So yeah. we had to address that. And I was reinforcing that a lot. I was validating. I think validating the wounded child is also really important. Like, oh my gosh, you were alone with this. You were not only did nobody help you, they blamed you. It's like a double whammy of a Right. bad reaction to what really needed to happen. And I said, I know, and he kept saying, well, they had good, int I said, I know they had good intention and it didn't, it wasn't what was needed. So let's like, let's just make our own movie now. And I know this isn't what happened in history, but let's redo this in a way that uh, feels much better to that part of you. And, and it's amazing how much a person's uh, psychological and physiological state can shift in a relatively short period of time, usually. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And then they have the felt experience of safety. Yes, the felt embodied experience of getting their needs met mm -hmm. and feeling safer and also, in this case, supported and protected. Protection is a big part of secure attachment. Right. And I like that he didn't just burst out of the room and get on his bike. He rode into nature. He, I mean, it, yeah. it carried on. So he had some really good resources there. It took a while. Yeah, because he said he just rode his bike. And then I asked him the question, well, I know you're riding your bike away from this trauma, but it's also important to know what are you riding your bike to? Yeah. And then he had to try a whole bunch of different destinations oh. to get one when, when he finally goes, I tried home, that wasn't it. I tried my best friend's house, that wasn't it. But riding in this path into nature, that was it. So then he started describing how the the water would freeze and then there was a steam coming off the water and the sunlight hitting the sparkles of the dew and everything and how beautiful it was. And I mean, and he was going completely into what we call ventral vagal or completely into a deeply relaxed and resourced state coming from a very scared and um, mm -hmm. collapsed and shut down and painful, really, really painful 
experience of what had just happened. So we have this potentiality, but as facilitators, we sort of need to have some clues about how do we facilitate that? Because if you just say, okay, I'm riding my bike, that might've been enough for some people. But for me, it was like, yeah, great. Bikes are great, but where are we going? <laughs> you know? right. Where's the safe right. and where's the, the safe, yummy place? Is that a person? In this case, it wasn't, or is that nature? And, and he, 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 had to figure that out. It took a few minutes, you know, to go, no, it's not that, it's not that, it's this, you know? And then when you hit that, it's like winning the lottery, you know, in terms of healing. Yeah. And then he has the experience of down-regulating and going into ventral yeah. vagal. And that becomes really installed. It's not just a brief thing. I'm right. my brain. It, it actually had enough time to really settle in. You're mentioning something um, that's so important. So I want to highlight that is we would do these strong emotional experiences and then stop and just let that process through his body and then um, allow it to settle and then or re remind him of resources while he's in those mm -hmm. states and then calm that and give time for that to calm and settle. And he was able to I could see in his breathing, but he was also able to report, yeah, now I'm settled. And then I would do the next piece, but you oh. don't want to just do trauma, 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 or just settle, settle, settle. Either one of those alone aren't going to usually make it work so well. So it's the back and forth mm -hmm. in the right relationship and proportion to what the nervous system can handle at that moment, given that particular trauma memory. Right, right. So compassion mm. and our connection with ourselves, kind, connected, loving, unconditional. Uh, what what would you say about that? Well, I I find that, that 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 also usually happens organically when we we heal enough of our wounds. You know, um, very often there's something on top of a, a wound that's keeping us away from being able to be self loving and kind to ourselves. And so Ooh. sometimes I think it's nice just to, to notice your inner talk. And then when it gets negative, you can reframe it right away. That's a helpful practice. But also I had this experience personally, I was uh, in a situation where I was uh, really rejected by uh, someone close to me. And I had such a strong reaction to it. I, I was really upset and I couldn't get myself unupset. Usually I can recover pretty fast. I was just upset, you know, and every time I thought about it, I would go from revenge fantasies to they did this. I can't believe they did that. I mean, just all this, you know, yeah. rough and tumble stuff coming out. I'm like, okay, I must be sitting on top of some wound because it's really won't just shut up. You know, it's like, I was dreaming about it. I mean, it's on all levels <laughs> coming at me. And finally, I mean, we're talking about maybe six months of following really a painful I'm like wow this is I can't believe it's this hard you know because I'm pretty practiced at doing these things and then finally I realized it was a wound about self-love my family wasn't particularly skilled at having a loving environment and or encouraging one to have loving connection to yourself so I had a big wound around self-love I'm pretty uh, skilled at being loving, but I wasn't so good uh -huh. at being loving towards myself. So then I started waking up eventually as I got further into the hole of this and I stayed with it. It was painful. Um, I started to wake up feeling love and just love in general. But then I started to realize, oh, this is self-love. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something really important for me. So the, there was a gift and it was sort of like, where's the, you know, there's a room full of feces or whatever. And then where's the pony? Right. I finally found the pony. And then that, then that took some time, but it, it, it shifted it for me. So I think it's not always like, oh, just be more compassionate. I think sometimes there's something there that's in the way. And if we can allow ourselves to be curious and open to feel what's in the way, then we eventually feel the actual experience. Right. Yeah. And it's so important for this to be in our bodies and hearts, not just in our mind. Yeah. I think it's hard. Like people say things, well, did you forgive that person yet? Or like, you should just be able to flip a switch and, or have you gotten over that loss? You know, mm -hmm. I think it's an organic and it takes the time it takes. And, um, to be uh, kind to ourselves about not just trying to flip a switch, but we actually go mm -hmm. through a process and that allows us to have a stabilized sense of resolution over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't well, really talk about the attachment adaptations. I don't know if you want me to mention any of that. Yeah, or... let's, yeah let's go there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're just looking, and I don't want anybody that's a parent to blame themselves because you might be recognizing some things as I talk about this. I mean, we usually learn our parenting from our parents and our grandparents, and it's a very easily generationally transmitted uh, thing. And I think parenting is one of the most challenging things on the planet. So I have really deep 
<laughs> gratitude and um, respect for anybody engaging in that activity. Uh, it's not the easiest thing. So, but let's just take a look at what can happen so we can also see what we can do to, to make things better uh, in our relationships. First of all, some parents, you know, either have unresolved trauma or they just have grown up in a way they don't know how to be present. And so avoidant adaptation will happen for kids when their parent's not present or sometimes it goes all the way to the parent being hostile or rejecting to the child. So every time the child's secure attachment system is trying to reach out and connect, the parent's either not there and a, and a not present parent's really terrifying to a child. So, um, cause we need our parents, right? And so nobody's home is scary. And then if they're hostile, of course, that's scary. And then sometimes what causes avoidant attachment is um, parents only show up and are present when they're, you're teaching a child a left brain activity, like how to read or how to do math or how to ride the bike or how to, you know, any, any how to function task kind of thing. So that then kids really, what usually happens at avoidant attachment is you get a very overdeveloped or highly developed um, left brain but not very much right brain because there's not emotional attunement, there's not presence, and that's needed for your secure attachment system to bond. So kids kind of th get thrown back on themselves. They're queuing for attachment, but that's rejected so, or not, nobody's there. And so they just go, they, they re I call it reactive autonomy. They develop real autonomy, which is a good thing, but mm -hmm. underneath it is this huge wound. And so they don't know how to co-regulate because nobody was there enough to co-regulate with. So for someone with avoidant attachment, the co-regulation exercises are really important. And um, the other thing is they'll tend to do parallel attention, which means they do things on their own. Like they get lost in the computer, might be pornography, uh, might be video games, might be TV. They, they tend to do things alone uh, because they don't value the co-regulation of doing it with someone else. So helping them learn how to have joint activities where they actually watch a movie and discuss it with their spouse or they're on a drive and they actually talk about or they stop at coffee shops and they they mm -hmm. they interact that's a, that's a stretch that's hard because for avoidance it's stressful to be in connection to approach or be approached. And so I usually have them practice that like okay one time this week approach your partner approach your child or approach your friend and just in initiate a, doing something in a joint way and then to see if you can stay present for the jointness of it, you know? Yeah. And that's just takes time to learn, but they can learn it. And then they really realize relationships can be nourishing, but their original template that got built in usually in chi as a baby is that relationships are not nourishing and why go there? You know, I do it better myself. You know, I'm better just by myself. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're trying to shift that. And when you ask them to resource, they'll resource around trees and the sky and music and art, but they don't include people. So you're just gradually trying to help them include people as resources because in their experience, and it doesn't mean they don't like people or they don't want connections. The thing, I have a pet peeve about that because a lot of attachment writers say avoiding people don't want a connection. They do. They do like anybody else. They have secure attachment as a primary attachment system like anyone else. It's just that they're their adaption is to shut the attachment system down. They basically turn their attachment system off because it was too darn painful to want connection and nobody was there or somebody was there in a negative way. So understanding that and then helping people be very courageous to feel their initial longing to connect that comes from secure attachment, they'll think of that as a bad thing. Oh, I'm feeling this longing. I hate it. I don't want that. And you go, no, that's your secure attachment saying hello. That's your, your initial wanting to connect, but with people that have more capacity to connect back with you. So you just have to restructure that whole experience. But like you said so many times, it has to be an embodied, lived experience of the nourishment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a very thumbnail sketch. <laughs> There's lots more to it, but does that give you a little bit of an idea? Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, And it's so helpful because it really helps people to see it's not something broken in me. It's my experiences have led to this condition of avoidance or nervous system dysregulation or whatever. And I can do something about that. Exactly. There are so many yeah. things that are helpful to repair that. And they have that capacity. They just have adapted by turning it off. It's kind of right. like saying, oh, geez, you know. 
you know, it, it's like having a light switch that's turned off and you don't realize you can turn it on. And so you turn it on, you go, oh my gosh, there's all this light. There's all this capacity. <laughs> wow. You know, so we're basically trying to turn the attachment system back on, you know, in a way that it's functional and, and really helps the person. But they have to do it gradually because they didn't turn it off just for fun. It's like turning off hunger or turning off sleep or something. This is a major instinct to connect. And we're designed, our brain social, we're designed to connect. We regulate through connection. So to turn that off is not like, oh, well, I don't need it. it. Something really difficult over and over again had to happen for a person to adapt that direction. And when you, the other thing I love about this so much, Lynn, is at, when you understand it, and especially in your, your relationships that you really rely on, you don't blame the other person and you don't take things personally so much. Oh, like mm -hmm. I had somebody that's important in my life um, just dropped out. I mean, I would write them emails and I would call and I had no response, you know? And I thought, wow, this is avoidant attachment behavior. Something must be going on. I mean, they're really in their avoidant attachment. And then about a, a five days later, they surfaced and said, I'm really sorry. And they even said, because they know my work, they said, oh, I, I just got into my avoidant thing. And I just didn't want to, I just was avoiding everything. And I thought, okay, I understood that like immediately. I didn't feel like... I norm if I hadn't known that I would have felt like wow they're kind of a jerk I mean I would have had a different reaction you know but it's, I went yeah I get it you know I understand and they were luck they was fortunate they were able to own that so quickly too I really give them kudos for that mm -hmm. and then with do you want me I'll just say I know we're getting a little close to the end of our time together I could talk to you for days yeah, um, <laughs> ambivalent is a different situation so these are just different adaptations to how we interpreted our childhood how right. we internalized it and ambivalent is where parents have been usually somewhat available but then they are really unpredictable the biggest problem is inconsistency so like so the child's trying to relax into the hug of the parent but the parent kind of drops them not like maybe physically but somehow they get distracted or they disconnect in a way that's really disruptive it happens too much of the time so i call it on again off again parenting and yeah. it causes a lot as you can imagine it unpredictably causes us to go into high anxiety states and we start to feel um I mean, in psychological terms, it would be called intermittent reward. And you were asking me uh, when we talked on the phone a little bit about addiction. Um, intermittent reward makes you um, obsess on the person that's being intermittent or the situation that's being intermittent. Uh -huh. like, like gambling works because it's intermittent, right? Like it's not like you're going to mm -hmm. win every third time. There's no predictability. And so people get hooked. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm going to do it again in another quarter or another $5 or another $100 or whatever, you know, and it, because of the intermittent reward, it, it kind of creates this, you know, obsession. Mm -hmm. And that happens relationally in ambivalent attachment. So a child that has parent in and out, this has gotten a little challenging because a lot of us can't survive economically without having two parent families. When I, back in the fifties, when I was growing up, I'm old, <laughs> my mom was a stay at home mom. She didn't really want to be, she would have preferred working because she would has the perfect personality to be a CEO or something, yeah, but she was kind too. of a frustrated mom, but she was there, you know? Yeah. So I didn't have the experience of only seeing her a few minutes a day or, you know, at dinner and then homework and bed, you know? Um, so this intermittent reward thing's a little trickier. So you have to make sure you got some quality time with limited time and it's challenging I'm not saying this is easy but uh, what happens with on again off again parenting is a child can react to that you don't may not react in all these ways but these are I'm just going to give you a sweeping view um, of being really clingy and needy and, a, and and trying to keep engaging the parent when the parent really can't be engaged uh, because maybe they're working or something um, so it can bring in this clinginess and as therapists, we need to get comfortable with clinginess and, and understand that that's a signal cry that can't get turned off. So unlike avoidant who shuts their attachment system down, the ambivalently attached adapted person um, amps their attachment system up. So they're like attachment on steroids. And the problem is th with that, it, they're very relationally oriented though. You definitely know they want to be in a relationship with you. And if they're avoiding, you're not sure, you know, <laughs> but with ambivalent, they're like really wanting a lot from you usually. And that demand, that clinginess and constant demand can sometimes push away the people they love the most. So that's mm -hmm. tricky. That's painful and, and really shouldn't happen because there's ways we can work with that. It's easier to calm an overactivated attachment system than it is to lift the brakes on an attachment system, actually, for most therapists and for most people. But um, 
so what will happen is they learned early on as infants that if they kept crying, like it's called a signal cry, they would eventually possibly get something. Mm -hmm. So what happens in adult relationships it often comes out as complaining. You mm -hmm. didn't do this. And why don't you care about me enough? And why didn't you bring me anything for Valentine's Day? And you never do this and you never do that. And, and they're complaining because the signal cries trying to get what they want, but usually it has the opposite effect. So once they know that and they learn to ask for their needs in a, a kinder way, like, oh, it was so great last anniversary when you took me for that surprise dinner. I so appreciated that. Very different message, right? And the right. person wants to do it again. Uh, even though that's somewhat obvious when I say it, they don't know that. So they tend to enter into a yes, but, oh yeah, you did that, but you didn't do it these five other times. And so people mm -hmm. start feeling like, I can never satisfy this person. And partly that's true until they do the work because what ambivalence don't know, and we have to own our own attachment stuff and feel it in our own bodies to recognize it. I'll do this thing with them. I'll say, okay, let's imagine you have a buffet of all these wonderful things that you would want in a relationship, you know, kisses and hugs or loving notes or trips to Hawaii or whatever. You just make, just take time and make this whole buffet of all these things that you want in your relationship. And they do that. And then I say, now I want you to just take that in. And they go, what? <laughs> I go, yeah, I want you just to receive that. And they go, oh, my whole stomach just got really tight. My whole body is going. Arr. And I go, no, that's really interesting. This is everything you want. And yet you're having this negative reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And the reason that, and so then, then I say, okay, let's take 1% or one molecule of all this good stuff. And they go, oh yeah, I can do that. My stomach can relax. I can tell, oh, I want more. I'm like, okay, great. What can you take in now? Well, I think I can do 4%. Okay, great. Let's do 4%. And they start to realize they have a trouble receiving. They do not get that. That's completely unconscious. So until they realize that it's not always the other people are being not okay or bad or doing the wrong things, that they actually don't have a receiver. Yeah. Um, they have to practice staying present when good things happen. And they also ignore caring behaviors. They don't realize they do that either. So I have them list all the caring behaviors and they're like, what do you mean? That a guy doesn't do anything. He's never around. I'm like, wait a minute. Look, you've been with this person for two years. I must've done something that was caring. Right. And they get mad at me even like, oh God, oh, no, no, they do. The, they, they didn't show up for this because they were out on a business. And I'm like, I know, I know. Cause the complaining cups, you have to be willing to go through lots of complaining. And then, and they'll say, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Well, they call me every night to see how my day went. Well, that's kind of nice. What else? Well, they bring me really nice gifts back from the business trips and they're always things I love. So they must know something about me. And then they're like shocking themselves as they're noticing caring behaviors. They're like going, oh, wow, I never thought of that. You know, so you can't win with them until they do the work because anything you do gets ignored or they focus on the negative right. and avoidance will focus on the positive in the future. Uh, ambivalence focus on the past. They have a really hard time letting go of old hurts and they tend to interpret negatively. Now they're very cued in to relational signals. So like if you don't smile or don't smile long enough in their opinion, or you don't hug them long enough, they have an immediate abandonment reaction mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll be wounded really easily. Now the thing is they misinterpret. They are very good at reading these signals, but they misinterpret them towards the negative very often they're wrong about what they experience because they're just replicating like we all do. Their history is yeah. getting projected on the future. So until they start to see that and start to be able to receive and feel fulfillment and satisfaction, they don't have a capacity to feel fulfillment and satisfaction because their original relational template was so um, mm. disappointing on again, yeah. off again. So an ambivalent person will enter a relational conversation either with tremendous sadness and disappointment in the other person, if they have a little bit of ambivalent, if they have a lot of ambivalent because their parents were more extreme, they will enter with anger. They'll enter with attack. You mm -hmm. don't do this. You don't do that. You know, and, and it's not a great place to start for getting what you want. You know, so it's like helping a person realize what works better and helping them practice it and definitely practicing receiving. And there's all sorts of other things that we, we try to break it down into doable practices. And then people are shocked at how much their relationships, their perception of their relationship and also how they feel in their relationship and also what the other person's willing to give them starts to shift in a pretty major way. Right, right. Wow. 
So you have a couple of books about a tattoo. Oh yeah. Do you yeah. want to talk about them? Like where could, and let's get your website address in here again. Oh yeah. It's um, Diane Poole Heller. My name, really simple. Diane Poole Heller. Poole has an E on the end. Uh, DianePooleHeller.com. And we have our attachment quiz there. And then some, you know, we're redoing our website, but right now uh, you can see the trainings we have. We have a, a Dare One training, which is on this early dynamics coming up. Uh, let's see, January 22nd to 24th, 2021. It'll be online. Okay. So because of the pandemic we usually do it live but right. um it'll be online and we've been doing online what it used to be live online and they've gone really well so Allison Halquist is teaching that she's one of my uh, really great teachers for dare and then she's also teaching dare Two, which is how this infiltrates into your adult relationships and that's march 12 to march 14 2021 so you're welcome okay. to contact us through support at dianepoolheller.com and mary will send you all the information if you can't uh, read it easily it's on the website should be easy um, we have a store that has a ton of resources we also have um, a course that i'm doing with peter levine i'm hosting him to do developmental truck shock versus shock trauma that'll be that we have the uh, free expert spotlight on that january 20th and it starts february 3rd and goes through march 3rd um mm -hmm. we do a monthly thing called therapy mastermind circle right now we're into intergenerational trauma and that probably be moving into collective trauma we haven't nailed that down 100 percent yet but mm -hmm. we're really working with that we feel like it's such a huge dynamic that's filtering mm -hmm. into people's you know, challenges. And sometimes your challenges are coming from your ancestors, not directly from your life experience this time around. So um, that's really helpful for some clients that you might be a little bit stuck with and you're, or you're having stuck healing your own process. So we're enlightening that. You can join that right in at, right now if you go on to support at dianepoolheller.com. Oh yeah, the books. I wrote Power of Attachment and it's uh, written um, for the public, but also lots of exercises in there that can be used in as interventions and in treatment. And mm -hmm. it's called the power of attachment it's produced by sounds true you can get it through them but certainly it's probably easier even to get it through amazon mm -hmm. and then i also did a, a cd soundtrack because a lot of people don't like to read they, they like to listen you can listen in your car uh, but don't do the exercises in your car do those at home um, and that's called healing your attachment wounds and that's also through sounds true and then i wrote a book on high impact trauma called crash course which has to do with uh you know trauma in general um and it's some it's not it's some about attachment stress but more about individual traumatic events and how our, we work with that so just a couple things that might be helpful resources for anyone so these are for everybody not just for therapists these courses? we pretty uh the online courses we do are are framed in terms of you'll be hearing about interventions and how to work with different things but it's we have a like a certain percentage of people that come on for their own personal growth reasons and they can practice these interventions on their own or have a friend do them or get or talk to their therapist about it if they're in therapy and they can you know mm -hmm. do those exercises so we found people have really benefited but it's the thing we're now starting a program that's specific for the public and the the uh, cds i talked about healing your attachment wounds and the power of attachment book is written uh, for the public uh, but can certainly be used for therapy and also i think the therapy courses often many people can benefit from but uh mm -hmm. we'll eventually have separate courses for specifically for um mm -hmm. for uh folks that are on their own healing journey mm -hmm. well i think you have a lot of resources on your website there's a lot there and then the attachment quiz too which can get people off to a good start so yeah, yeah. people enjoy the attachment quiz just just we're we're updating it and uh it needs to be rewritten when we're doing that but um it's 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 helped a lot of people as it is so uh you can, t can take it with that caveat <laughs> yeah yeah and then your blog as well there's a yeah, lot of we ways. put a lot of blog, we put a lot of free information out, like we just did the free yeah. summit that you were talking about, the trauma and attachment summit. And we try to, we try to, we sort of have a pay it forward philosophy of trying to make a lot of things available, because I really think working with attachment and certainly resolving trauma can really shift your life experience tremendously, mm -hmm. personally, yeah. but also with all the collective trauma and the kind of tra traumatic eruptions we're having, certainly mm -hmm. in our, in our culture here in the U.S., um, and probably other people's countries too, but I'm more familiar with the United States uh, tumultuousness at the moment. Um, yeah, I think we have so much collective trauma popping up because we, we have to hold some of these things and heal yeah. some of these things as a group. And take on, as we do our own personal healing, it opens us up to have the stability to hold things like genocide, slavery, um, what's happened to our indigenous uh, peoples, um, 
Holocaust survivors, war survivors. And we have more space in us to hold collectively what can happen for healing because there's a lot of un unhealed, really atrocity level things that I, and I think we as a, a human race really need to find the strength mm -hmm. to deal with. And I know Thomas Hubble, he does some uh, in collective things that I think are really beautiful. We're going to do an interview soon. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing him soon, but um, I, uh, I just feel like there's so much potential, but I don't think we can really enter into that larger space without having done a lot of our personal history and our personal intergenerational history. So we have to kind of go into that prepared because it's strong energy and we have to have support. I don't think of like, it's so great an idea to do it alone. I think it's really great to do that more as a, as a group that's committed mm -hmm. to holding the energy and helping it process through and helping healing happen. This is not a small thing. And a lot of these things have been going on for centuries and they haven't really been dealt with. Right. So. Yeah, and if we can be self-regulated and co-regulate with each other, that's really how that work's going to happen. It's powerful. We're all very powerful, and and when we're interconnected, we're even more powerful in the in the direction of healing. When I do live trainings and and even on the online ones, when everybody comes together, you have that whole coherent field that's supporting the healing, even for one person, uh, to happen. And so much beautiful healing can happen in that kind of a context, as well as personal mm -hmm. therapy or even mm -hmm. in your relationship or you're with your friends. You know, there's different right. ways we right. access depending on what feels right to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been great, very educational and interesting. And I really appreciate that you come on and, and share this with us. Beautiful. It's been a delight for me too, Lynn. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Take care. And thanks everybody Ooh. for taking the time to watch and listen. Welcome to the 2021 Radical Recovery Summit, presented by the Killaby Center for Recovery. This is Lynn Fraser, your moderator. This year, our theme is Feel It, Heal It, a new paradigm of recovery, featuring a diverse group of thought leaders and innovators, people who are working on the ground in the new field of addiction recovery. Go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to sign up and watch free.